Greetings and welcome back, everyone. This is Into the Nexus, the podcast all about heroes of the storm. I'm Gary Weinzerl, here as always with Kyle Ferguson, coming at you one day and almost three hours later than we usually do. Why is that, Kyle? Because we are professionals, and there was a patch scheduled for 1.30 Pacific time in the afternoon on Friday. So here we are with the patch. Yeah, like, what else were we going to do yesterday, dude? Like, report on the meta that hasn't shifted that much. Take guesses. Yeah, uh, take guesses. To, you know. Be upset about a cloud mount. It's a weird, weird week. We could be mad about yeah, the cloud mount. Although, God bless you, Reddit commenters, because you took to it with the sincerity it deserved, which is none at all. Yeah, uh, <laughs> the comments were hilarious, and I was glad. I saw that post, man. I was like, "Oh, is this really what we're gonna talk about this week?" Oh, the comments are fantastic, wonderful. Okay, yeah, cool. I'm Moving like, on. I, we I, we moved on. We we've matured a little bit as gamers. We're used to this, you know. Diablo's coming up. They're telling us that oh, there's gonna be cosmetics, w- whatever, whatever. We're gonna live. Yeah, yeah, indeed. So we've got a big, fat, giant balance patch. Hot off the presses at the time of recording this, uh, the the it's been up for less than an hour. People have only played one storm league with this balance patch, so cutting edge ITN cast action tonight. Yeah, but we went through it. We organized it into buffs, nerfs, and reworks. I even took a lot of the buffs and put them under underpicked talent buffs mm, and yes. minor buffs, which I think only Diablo wow. goes under there. Literally, like one minor, tiny little change, but. Um, before we get into it, we want to thank the, our bosses, Kyle. We have over 300 bosses, um, and we're really lucky. Uh, I know some of you listening right now go, oh God, I have one and I can't stand them. Well, we have over 300 bosses and they're all amazing, uh, because they are supporting into the nexus over at patreon.com slash ITN. That is the opt-in way to support this podcast. This podcast is free. You wouldn't listen to it if it wasn't. We know how that works. And don't worry, we're never going to put it behind a paywall or anything of that nature. I'm not going to do anything dumb like that. But if you want to support the show, the Patreon is an opt-in way to do it. $1, $5, $10, you know, $1 million maybe one day. And then Kyle and I will open a studio on a private island. It'll be wonderful. I'm probably grossly uh, underestimating the cost of a private island. But whatever the case, patreon.com slash ITN is where you can go to support the show, get access to perks like the patron only discord, sign up and play games with us during our monthly patron bonanza streams where we're going to unranked. And on this episode, uh, thanking some of our more recent patrons. We thank you in the order that you sign up. So if you haven't heard your name, but yet don't worry, it's coming, but thank you to C. Michael Rafano, Henrik Lampinen and Jesse Gibson. Thank you for the support. Lots of chatter going on. The disc, our patron discord, like helped me today. It was like having our own little personal oh, yeah. newsroom because I was like, y'all, I, I can't find information about when this is supposed to drop. And everyone was like, it's supposed to drop at 430 Eastern. And no one had a link for me as to where that came from, but they were dead, dead on correct because at 430 on the dot, bam, patch time. And Something magical happens when you make a show just about one game, and then you make a chat room just for the supporters of that show about one game. That Discord's a magical place. You should all be in there. You should certainly be supporting the show. Now let's do it. Let's do balance. Yes, let's do it. We're on, boys! <laughs> let's liven up this place! The moment is upon us. Yes, I'd man tap that. So... Balance patch as of November 22nd, 2019. And there's this isn't Deathwing. This isn't Anomalies. There's still some big changes in store for this game. But in the meantime, we have a pretty sizable balance patch. A lot of heroes were messed with in here. And also one talent that is still on more than one hero. There's not many talents that we would call generic talents. Which I always feel generic is kind of mean sounding. It's not what we mean. It's just an easy way to kind of get across the idea that uh, it's a talent shared across multiple heroes. And that is Season Marksman. It's been changed. The cooldown is being reduced by half. It's going from 60, the full minute cooldown, down to a paltry 30 second cooldown. All right. And then the attack speed bonus duration is being increased from three to four seconds. Doesn't sound like this much, but when, when you're dealing yeah. in literal seconds, having one extra second tacked on is pretty big. 
Yeah, so 40% more attack speed for four seconds every 30 seconds after you complete the quest of killing nearby minions or being in the area of them, takedowns grant attack damage as well. So you're upping your attack damage with a button to up your attack speed. And this is only left on Artanis and Falstad. The other gen- non-generic, like, warped versions of these, like what's on Rainer and Illidan, are unaffected by this. And I don't think Illidan's even has a button anymore, and Rainer's is just a quest that goes on forever. So n- hardly even related at this point. Yeah, yeah. So this is pretty, it, like you said, affects Artanis and Falstad. Uh, the dev said since its removal on many heroes, season marketing has fallen off a bit due to needing to be tuned around so many different kits. Now that it has a home in fewer places, we're giving a fairly substantial buff to make it more relevant. So, Artanis and Falstad players were right in. Tweeted us. Let us know how this feels at ITN Cast. I'm curious. I found an Artanis main in Diamond 1 today. And that's all he played. And if he couldn't get it, he played Phoenix. So he had Committal. Protoss for, for the win, man. Yeah, yeah, that's just noble Protossian. I'm curious to see how this works if it is able to like completely change those into auto attack characters. So often Artanis is being more of a bruiser, aid frontline swapper, but not so much as the movement speed patch has messed around with him. If we can go full auto attack speed, that's kind of cute. I mean, Falstead has a really nice build with the secret weapon. It's just that sustained damage is tied to lightning and who doesn't want bribe and why not go with that build? Yeah. And Muffin Duggly, you're right. No zero tool. Uh, so that's even specific within Protoss. Sticking with the. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, he, he might be an Alarak main and never had a chance to pick him. So I don't know about that. I didn't go deep into his history. Could, could be. Could be the case. Could be the case. Uh, but let's get into it. Let's get into the balance tweaks on specific heroes. And we're going to start with buffs today. The heroes that were chained, changed that fall under buffs. Like, you re- can't really argue about it. Um, and it's pretty cut and dry, I think, this time around. There's not, not too many heroes that got, like, buffs and nerfs. So we didn't... Re- they actually, they made our job pretty easy on, our, on us, Kyle. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to kick things off with Leoric. Uh, and he had some buffs to his base kit. I always, 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 Kyle, get really excited about base kit changes. Talent changes are always a pretty big what if. And for most of 2019, a lot of talent changes, except when they're really obvious nerfs to meta picks, tend to be changes to talents a lot of us aren't playing with anyway. So talents are always a little hard to get our, wrap our brains around. Uh, So I always get really stoked about base kit changes. So Skeletal Swing is having the cooldown reduced by two seconds, going from 14 to 12. Um... I always like to look at the what that equates out to in a percentage because if you know in a perfect world where you had infinite mana and you could use it on cooldown every single time, how many more times in a game could you use this ability? Uh, and that, that's a 14% reduction, Kyle. That means you can use this 14% more often, essentially, over the course of an entire game. So that's considerably more lane clear, slow, whatever you're kind of building for. I'm curious to see if he'll have any viability on somewhere like Braxus. Neil Peasants does monster damage. That's pretty cute. The old infernal shrines with him. I mean, there's some cool avenues for the orc. We just don't need a bruiser that doesn't bring pure CC. Slows are very weird right now. And I think that's why we see the change with the decaying slow on Alex Straza later on. We got to decide what to do about him. And casting him more often is a way to enhance slows. We have Phoenix, we have Rainer, we have characters that do damage, bonus damage to slowed targets. But Thrall has a root. And that's why Thrall's amazing. Rexar has a straight up stun. Yeah. Uther, the way we're playing it, has a point and click stun. Ariel is maybe queen of high league supports. You got Rhaegar, who has a slow. He's in the front line. He's helping out all those squishies. Hanzo's taking camps. Got a big heroic that saves. But Ariel, with that stun, is really coming up. And she's being run alongside Uther in a lot, a lot of ways. Just to pile on the stuns. I'm curious to see if they enhance slows further. I, I don't know how you would enhance them 
any any more like it, you just want them to be roots like like yeah. own up to it Kyle you just uh, I wonder how they'll enhance them. that's that's Kyle's way that Kyle's polite way of saying I wonder when they will just turn slows into roots because it's otherwise they'll just never be as good I mean there is the Arthas talent where if they stay in your aura long enough it becomes a root and that thing is a lot of fun and very rewarding I certainly would love most slow heroes to have some sort of talent like that cuz let's let's say you do something crazy you give away for me to get resets on my skeletal swing increase the cooldown further maybe if I slow a target already slowed it becomes a root now we're getting into like pretty drastic kit changes but it's interesting yeah yeah uh well uh unyielding despair also uh, level 13, got to change the cooldown reduction if Drain Hope finishes was increased uh, from 2 to 3 seconds. So that's a buff. Relatively minor, but still a buff. Uh, you know, no, it, it's definitely not bad for the Yorick. No, no. Drain Hope, you know, not something we've really talked about because it hasn't been a part of our world. Artanis was brought up a lot during our movement speed changes because, well, he had to swap and he was rather popular at the time, particularly when Ana in the previous meta was all over the place. And we talked a lot about Ravenous Spirit and Nazebo because golds love Nazebo. They can't stop picking Nazebo. So we haven't really talked about Leoric and his Drain Hope and how damn slow that thing is and how you miss a lot of the time when you cast this thing, even if you're a seasoned Leoric. And this He's doesn't help. Really... It's not doing... Our build got nicer. <laughs> we have a nice build. It, a while ago, we talked about March of the Black King level 20 being the go-to talent because of Drain Hope attaching to people that you hit with March of the Black King. That's uh, funny. That's an interesting tidbit. Now that we're basically saying that this talent at level 20 allows us to actually land Drain Hopes and take advantage of a thing on this kit that's really hard to do otherwise. Yeah. Well, let's move on to Sonya. Uh, uh, I'm pretty stoked about this. More base changes here on Sonya. Whirlwind damage is going from 63 to 69. Doesn't sound like too much, but it's actually just shy of a 10% damage increase. Uh, and I, I kind of think it needs it because I have been favoring the slam, Kyle. I like well, the slam. If you heal for the damage you deal, any damage here is going to go a little crazy. Yeah, it does also, yeah, it has a kind of a multiplicative effect. Yeah, with uh with Sonya and her whirlwind damage. That's good to keep in mind as well. I'm also very excited because 10 seconds just got shaved off of Leap's cooldown. And you know how much I love taking Leap. Yeah. No, Leap's great. It is always win more, disappointing, Wrath of Berserker. Game's kind of weird right now. I I'm interested to see how Leap affects things. Currently, we we for one, uh, Deathwing hype died down, and I'm that's not a critique. I don't really care because I'm just going to keep playing the game and then Death will come out and be like, oh yeah, sweet. Totally. Awesome. But we're back to the main audience. Here's the storm is full of main players and all of our games are being decided by like level 16 fights. And you can be ahead all game and then one level 16 fight. It's not an old story. Well, it's, it's not a new story. It's an old story. But when things settle, we often go back to this. I'm curious to see how a stun coming in at 10 being more popular, perhaps, will make Sonya a better pick. Yeah, I don't, I don't know because to me, it, it really just gives her kit a, a major missing piece of the puzzle, which is she's a bruiser yeah. and it's reliable CC. Now it's reliable CC on a long cooldown, slightly less long. Now it's now we're at that one minute on the dot sweet spot. This is where I like my heroics to be. Uh, but I mean, yes, her her spear does stun, but not for very long. Yeah, it's a sweet interrupt if you are so skilled as to do it on a Genji. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, they'll keep on running. I mean, there's no finer feeling in this world than landing a spear on a Genji or a Tracer. But yeah, it, it, you, you shouldn't bank on it. No. I think no matter how good you are <laughs> as a Sonya player. Um, but but yeah, so I, I'm, I'm happy about this. Also, level 16 Rampage Ancient Spear cooldown reduction was increased from half a second to one and a half seconds. That's a 200% increase. <laughs> So this is basic attacks reduce the cooldown of Ancient Spear. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I actually, I'm super stoked. This is like, I love this. I don't go this build, but I love, I love when we're just winning so hard I can. 
because it's just fun to just be spearing as often as possible. Well, let me tell you a little about something called my Johanna counter. And I've been flirting around with this a little bit, but I finally decided that, yes, I'm not crazy. I have an awesome Diablo build with Life Leech. And I use Diablo currently as a Johanna counter because Johannas just stand there. They just, they're in the area for extended periods of time. Same with Stitches, but he's going to like back up and go fishing. I just stand there auto attacking Johanna, getting souls for everyone I do and healing myself. That talent on Sonya would be really good into Johanna. And if Johanna is this early pick that she is right now, an early ban too, I think people are just banning her on Tomb of the Spider Queen because we're all just bored. We're all bored of her. No one wants to see Johanna anymore on that map. Great lane clear. That's a great pick. And maybe you can notice in your own games a opportunity to go, wait, they have a Johanna. They have a tank that's just going to stand there. Well, let's take some auto attack talents. You think it's a little late? At 16, because the, the fights at 16 are pretty throw down right now, whether there's a Johanna or not. I, mean, how- I did just say that, yes. We don't get to auto-attack much in melee. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Diablo's kind of nice at four. Yeah. It's like I- everyone's standing on the pad. We're like, do you hurt me? Do I hurt you? Let's figure this out. Do you want to go to the top temple or the bottom? What's going on right now? I, I like this change a lot, but I think this talent is too late. Uh, way mm. too late. Like, I think this should be a level seven. Maybe, maybe actually, I'm jumping ahead, but uh, taking into account a change they made to a level four talent for Arthas, I think there's a strong argument that this talent could be bumped way earlier in uh, Sonya's talent tier. Well, you also get 25% increased, increased attack damage. So, hmm. They could find a way to get around that. It's still up against Giant Slammer and Nerves of Steel. And here we are being like, auto attack talents at 16. That's not going to work yet. We're taking Giant Slammer in a lot of games. So, but I agree. I agree. Yeah. Interesting. But what if, what if we had a huge philosophy change and we took all of our auto attack talents and we put them early and we took all our CC talents and we put them late and we just sort of, you know, took advantage of auto attacks when they can actually be done it would mesh more with the like the crescendo of severity yeah. <laughs> of a game of heroes of the storm uh i think but yeah we'll see we'll see the m- minor note uh, i'm really stoked about the whirlwind and the leap changes i'm very on board for that as a i will never let m- the sonya dream die so i like these changes let's talk about white main uh first off they said indulgence at level four has been changed to be classified as a trait talent that's just like a change of semantics. Yeah, yeah. We're making sure that when you pick that talent, it is an overall change not affecting your direct heal. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, let's get into the base kit changes. Inquisition on your W. The cooldown has been reduced from 14 to 12. Uh, and also, the damage has been increased from 47 to 50. It's slightly over a 6% damage increase right there. And then uh, Zeal, your trait, the cooldown has been reduced by a whopping 20 seconds, going from that one minute mark down to only 40 seconds for your zeal trait. It's got to make a couple of white mains out there pretty stoked. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. I don't is know if like, I'll ever be happy again. Is that like old man with a beer belly Kyle in a recliner voice? What was that? Uh, it, it's my, it's my, I think white mains are crazy. The only ones crazier than them are bright wing players. And we'll get to that in a moment. Oh, are and- you going to throw some shade at my bright wing? Oh, every time, man. They're nuts. I think... I think White Mane is having the same sort of CC problem with the slow. And they went in and augmented Inquisition, which is really cute. I would be more excited if this buff was to Searing Lash. Because it's still sitting there kind of weird. After 0.5 seconds, smite an enemy hero dealing damage. It casts a second time. If it hits a hero, I get that it's tied to a healing, but like, what else? Like, what, what, <laughs> what else do you got? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. All damage to white main is a buff. Let's see how it works out. Right. Right. That's really what it, what it boils down to. Uh, and then they got, uh, white main's got a bunch of under picked talent 
buffs. So uh, Pity the Frail at one, Martyrdom at four. Uh, Scarlet E just doesn't really fall into that level 10. That White Mane's actually pretty damn good talent diversity on their heroics. But level one, level four, and level 20 Scarlet Crusade, they all got buffs. Uh, very much not the most pal- popular talents out there. Scarlet Crusade uh, barely taken at all if you look at uh, fan uh, statistic websites. Um, so, yeah. But Scarlet Age is a massive cooldown reduction, going from 90 seconds down to 60 seconds. One minute? That's the sweet spot. Yeah. 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 Uh, they said, And also, apparently, that cooldown reduction uh, it was a, a missed... Uh, a buff that was supposed to come in with the last patch. Oh, cool. Yeah. I'm glad yeah. they found it. According to the dev comments. So uh, let's get into uh, underpick talent buffs. Uh, I, White Mane would have been categorized under here if not for her base talent improve or base, uh, base kit improvements. Uh, and first up is Alex Straza. Uh, just a ton of talent buffs. Uh, Flames of Fury at one. Uh, having the uh, an additional functionality tacked on of reducing the mana cost of Flame Buffet from 50 to 40. Uh, heat Exhaustion at level 4 had the slow amount reduced from 60 to 50%, which is technically a bad thing, but it also had additional functionality of also causing the slow from Flame Buffet to no longer decay. So the slow isn't quite as strong as it was before, but the 50% slow is still very good. And now it's not yes. going to decay. And decaying stinks with slows, so why the heck not? That's fabulous. And the fact that this build is really fun to play because you get more Dragon Queen cooldowns is nice. And there are some viabilities you know, between both the Circle of Life kind of builds and your Gift of Life builds. You get to make a really tactical choice there. However... If you're in the solo lane on Braxis, it is so insanely rare that you would even say, oh my goodness, I'm going to farm up my Flames of Fury. Let's do it. You just pass and do a more reliable build. So I'm curious to see if this works out. I love getting rid of Decaying Slows with Talents. Fabulous. (laughs) Uh, Level 13, Dragon Scales. Uh, The armor amount was increased from 40 to 50. Pretty, Pretty basic buff there. Uh, Tough Love at 16, the armor amount was increased from 20 to 25, and the armor duration was increased from 2 to 2.5 seconds. Finally, uh, Ancient Flames at 20 no longer reduces Alex Draza's attack speed. So Armor Talon's taking the lead here against many populars like Pacify, of course. Uh, Life Unbound here and there, Dragon Discipline. There's some really important ones here at 13, 16, and you can give Armor, which we're just talking about things getting a little too explosive in the late game. Hey, that's an option too. Let's incentivize armor talents. I like that. I like that. Again, they're doing it on underpicked talents. So I don't like, it's always hard to kind of tell how that's going to land. Yeah. But uh, I mean, we notice trends all the time um, and we don't always love them. Looking at you quests. But uh, I wouldn't mind this becoming a trend and this being another thing they continue to more fully form out of the, the clay that is Heroes of the Storm balancing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, let's let's ride that. I'm curious to see if we can catch on to what they're doing here. Auto attack talents maybe earlier, armor talents later. Because the whole problem with Urel was that she was Mario jumping around giving armor to all her friends during late HG, HGC. And we had to get rid of that. It was an early talent. What does that look like later? It's gone now. But what does it look like later on? What does it look like at 16? Yeah. And I guess it looks like Mario jumping around just way later. And what if we, for white main sake, said that let's do a little 10 switcheroo and that she gave unstoppable to everyone in the area around her but the armor's tied to level 20. Interesting. I actually, that, I, I kind of like that because there's a lesson to learn there. It's kind of the problem with um, Bloodlust. Like, Bloodlust inherently isn't awful, 
the idea that you're going to give everyone 40% tax speed, 35% movement speed and heal them for 30% of the attack damage they deal. But it's the movement speed that is the worst because then they, then they just go, just go running off. They're already scared. No one's got to auto attack because they're all terrified when you pop this. They end up in weird places across the map. Uh, Ariel Resurrect kind of has the same issue. You get movement speed? Like, what? You, you're just not expecting it. Uh, that is tied to her level 20, though, by the way. That could use some augmenting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, let's talk about Tyrande. As much as we want to talk about Ariel. Um, again, underpicked talents across the board, getting buff, level one, everlasting life, the, uh, or sorry, as everlasting light healing bonus increase from 45 to 60%. Cool. Still not 100% sure I'm going to take it. Uh, level four, true shot aura, active damage bonus increase from 15 to 25%. We're still taking our increased range. Oh, on Lunar Flare. What's that? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to flare yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't think this is enough. Uh, Starfall, damage increase from 88 to 92. I mean, it's not a bad thing, but I feel like you need to do a little bit more there. Well, she's cooldown based, not damage based. So she's the other switcheroo from White Main. More damage is great. It's just not going to equal more healing. It's more zoning. Well, I mean, yeah, it's... It's just really minor up uptick. So is it more zoning than it already was? Like, I mean, you're probably not terrified in the first place of the Starfall. I mean, you should be because you should go, oh, no, I'm going to make more healing for the enemy team. I got to get out of this thing. I would be very curious to see if they, instead of damage, gave it a speed increase because that'd be a healing increase. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, level 13, Quickening Blessing, Light of a Loon's bonus movement speed increase goes from uh, is, is going from 15 to 20%. No? Is that one pretty good? Or I don't mind this one. Moonlight? I don't mind this one. Okay. Uh, it, it's interesting. For sure. Um, I like movement speed increases a lot, especially on healers. Uh, especially on healers that have abilities that they can use multiple times. And Taronda and Brightwing are, are up there, and they have abilities that they can use relatively in short order that dish out movement speed if you talent certain ways. Uh, matter of fact, I believe... Well, no, that not that Pixie Dust talent, but a Pixie Dust talent to get adjusted on Brightwing. I'm getting ahead of myself. but um, And then at level 20, uh, Eyes of the Huntress, the reveal duration was increased from 2 to 10 seconds. I mean... It, if you needed a really, really obvious indicator of just how poor of a level 20 talent this was before, going from 2 to 10 seconds of reveal is, I think, a pretty good indicator, pretty good example. 2 seconds of revealing the enemy team does not feel like a level 20 talent. And at 10 seconds, no. I think it does now. Yeah, you can get into position a little bit. How long is our stealth going for? Our stealth is 10 seconds, so hey, it's equal now. It matches. You feel sneaky. <laughs> also it no longer requires allies to be below 50% health to gain bonus healing which is really cool uh, so previously this lasted for 2 seconds and uh, and only gave bonus healing to allies that were below 50% so this is just all around better uh, I like eyes of, I like these changes eyes of the huntress and also celestial wrath uh, was was messed with as well has uh, now additional functionality that increases the slow from Starfall to forty percent. That's a good change. Yeah, you, know, you got to wait till twenty to get it. But again, this feels more like a level twenty talent. Before it was, uh, you know that well, then still does that. Uh, Starfall applies Hunter's Mark to enemy heroes while they're inside it, but now it's also on top of that going to increase the slow to forty percent. That's pretty cool. I like that a lot. But, like you said, we're deciding a lot of games at level 16 right now. Don't want to take Starfall to, you know, bet on getting to level 20 so that I can slow the ebb of living out of the enemy team and apply Hunter's Mark. Right. It's a cute move, but we're already so explosive. The armor's not what's winning. It's the CC. I'm a little lost on Taronda right now. I, I think it's really great that they buffed her. As I said, Ariel Uther, that's the double stack right now. Maybe Rhaegar Uther. What 
other hero would plug into this fabulously? Well, Taronda. Taronda does decent damage, and we're giving her a chance to have True Shot Aura. That'd be pretty hot. You know, we got a uh, applying Hunter's Marks to the whole enemy team. That's pretty cool. Maybe we can even Divine Storm them inside the Celestial Wrath. She's not there yet, and I feel like she's divided. Ariel, by dealing damage and being great right now, is getting more healing. But Taronda doesn't get more healing the more damage she deals. It's the more attacks she gets. Well, the other thing, so, too, is just uh, the safety of the composition. Ariel with the whip mm -hmm. uh, is more consistent safety than Taronda with a Lunar Flare. Yeah. Like, even if you don't hit the wall, even if you don't pull off the six stun as an Ariel, you are at the very least pushing someone away from you. Unless you're whipping entirely. But if you're doing that, you need to go back and practice your Ariel. Right. And there's a lot of cool conversations because I've been playing Oriole on my stream around resurrect. Like, could this have been a resurrect game? But it always comes back to, but you can't resurrect yourself. Uh, like I am going to die. I E just myself. We turn around the entire fight. And that's a whole conversation of Ariel that I think she should be able to self res. That'd be pretty sweet. But what I want Taronda to get there, but I feel like we're buffing both her healing and her damage at the same time. And because the way her kit works, those two things do not coexist. One does not buff the other. So I'm not sure where we should apply her yet. It, and she's It weak. feels a little old school in its sensibility, right? Because we use like in the earliest days of Heroes of the Storm, uh, you know, we, we even heard from the devs that one of the the, the largest indicators of uh, a great support player versus an okay or an average support player was damage done. That someone with yeah. a significantly higher win rate on any one healer consistently had higher damage numbers than the next tier or two below them playing the same healer. Um, but I, I, I wonder, it, it's pro I'm, I'm sure that there is still a correlation there. That, that, that one healer to another, the healer that's doing the more damage is probably winning more games. Um, but I, I don't know. I think for, for a lot of us and for your average heroes of the storm player, uh, as I mentioned, the, the kind of the safety that an Uther Oriole brings just completely out. It, it, it's just a, 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 an overall safer, more consistent bet to take. Um, and same thing with Rhaegar. I mean, it, it, totems don't feel the most impactful in the world, but it is probably doing a lot more to keep your team safe than you give it credit for. Well, and that it can soak three tower shots as a summon that has priority above heroes means you can do all sorts of wild stuff you couldn't pull off otherwise. Yeah, plus a lot of his additional damage comes via the lightning shield, which is just a... Yeah. You, you literally are applying extra damage to someone else and you can just fart off. Taronda has to be playing like a DPS at all times to heal efficiently. But she doesn't have the haunting wave. She doesn't have all these newer mobility things and no Aegis self-cast recovery. So Taronda's a detriment to a highly positional burst late game. Yeah. We also have to talk about the challenges, which is Taronda has been previously extremely oppressive. Yes. I do not want to go back to getting completely 1v1 by every Taronda ever. That felt Correct. bad. Yes. Yes. But from the outside looking in, it does look like maybe they could look at speed and tune the damage down to compensate for it. Love to talk to a dev about that. Yeah, I would like them to see the Starfall change go into speed rather than damage. That'd be interesting, and we, we, we'd be working towards her healing in the first place. So, set her G. But I'm sure they have a plan. Yeah, I'm not even sure added duration on Starfall would matter either. I think it has to be the speed at which the attacks hit. Yeah. So, it's more duration. Like, down. what is that? You know, we added five seconds to duration of Starfall. Well, that's cool. It's just five more seconds that the an enemy team just avoids the area, which is worth something, but it's not worth that much. Right. If you want heavy zone, you should do Fury of the Sun, Will Kael'thas, or even a Gazlo. Like, you're not mm -hmm. thinking, who on, well, what heroic can I take in this draft to zone out the enemy team yeah. on my support? Yeah, exactly. And you're the healer, so you should pick more healing. And that's what we're doing. That's why we're going Shadowstalk. So, 
anyways, uh, moving on. Nazebo getting some changes. Uh, they said that they saw the opportunity to make some of Nazebo's lesser pick talents more powerful and more importantly, more fun. So they took it. So level one, Widowmakers getting uh, some additional functionality. They reduced the mana cost of spiders by 10. Uh, another additional functionality is that upon completing the quest, you're going to reduce the cooldown of corpse spiders by two seconds. That's actually kind of sexy. As, yeah. As someone who is those... not particularly good at landing his corpse spiders. There are those quick match games where you find yourself as the backline sustain assassin and corpse spiders as the correct choice. Yes. Yes. Uh, also at level one thing of the deep, they added a uh, new functionality that uh, of, a, of a quest. After reaching 50 stacks of Voodoo Ritual, gain 10% spell power. After reaching 100 stacks of Voodoo Ritual, gain an additional 10% spell power. That's cool. I actually like a quest. This is cool. You're yeah. right. Yeah, you get the range that you always wanted that gets you just out of tower range. You can get a lot cuter with your zombie walls being at this new range. And 10% spell power. I mean, now we have kind of like a thing of the deep goes into Ravenous Spirit build for the spell power. Not that Gargantuan slamming around isn't going to, you know, do spell power damage, but that there's a reason to go down that road and plan ahead. It always felt like a crutch, even though I've really always liked taking thing of the deep, but it always felt like a crutch because at the end of the day, you were not adding damage to the, the equation, but now you are. Kyle, I think I think this change the thing of the deep is going to push some of those golden nazebos in the platinum. That, that's actually a really cool thought. The, the coolest thing about nazebo here is that wrong choices are becoming okay choices, and that's that's some nice balance. There shouldn't be a bunch of nazebos getting flamed for picking bad talents because there are bad talents to pick. They should buff those, and that's exactly what they're doing here. I'm also going to predict that in six months we're going to be baking this in because we're going to like it so much. I like the idea of Nazebo having something along the ride. There is a extremeness to vile infection that just leaves him feeling kind of bad. Again, it's the era we're in right now. Level 16 is winning. You don't get your level 20 Nazebo. And all that farm that they went and did feels like they didn't play the video game. Unless they also partied up with the Ragnaros. And then you're definitely getting to 20. Yes, but then they don't get the stacks because the lava wave ruined it. So we made a double mistake. <laughs> Is it okay? It's probably okay. It's probably. I not. mean, it's not the worst. There, there are worse things on Earth. You could do triple poison. You could take a Lunar and Azebo Malthiel comp. And then the enemy healer goes, well, I'll just heal the one that's about to die with poison because your damage is so slow. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, two more talents were messed with. Uh, Dead Rush, a level 7, had the bonus damage increase from 75 to 100%. And then uh, Dead Rush, by the way, one of my favorite talents that I'm not supposed to take. And then level 20, Annihilating Spirit no longer increases the movement speed of Ravenous Spirit. Uh, however, now that uh, each time Ravenous Spirit d deals damage to an enemy hero, its damage during that cast is increased by 5%. So the damage is going to ramp up as your spirit wails on its target. This is another, man, this evil got some cool talents. I know we've been like yeah. poo-pooing a lot of the under talent changes. I like basically everything that's happening here. Nah, it, it's pretty nice. I mean, he, Dead Rush helps you take camps. And if you were in gold, rocking Nazebo, well, you're not farming in lane. That's, I guess that's the problem, is you take camps great with Dead Rush, but you're not farming Vile Infection which is not as big a deal because we're not getting as late. We're looking at 74 damage, a slap on the dead rush. That's not awful. We're getting there. Let's, if I complete my quest, my, my level one quest now, how hard am I slapping? I am slapping for a whopping 81. Okay, maybe not something to write home about either, but Nazebo is becoming more versatile, and I like it. Nazebo slaps. Let's talk about Zagara. Uh, basic attack damage on Zagara. Going up 76 to 85. That is nothing to sneeze at. That's more than a 10% be... increase on basic attack damage. Well, if you like Zagara basic attacks, you're going to love all this. I might. <laughs> uh, 
Um, this is interesting because some of these are not just under pick talents. Level one uh, changes just everywhere at level one. Volatile acid, the, uh, basically the winner at level one. This is the most popular level one talent for Zagara. Uh, it no longer increases baneling damage against non heroic targets. Don't go anywhere. It now increases the damage of banelings by 20%. Flat. This means against structures. This means against mercenaries. This means, uh, well, non-heroic targets, obviously. But this means against heroes, most importantly. So it still travels 50% further. You are now doing more damage to heroes with your baneling hits. Yeah, you're not doing as much damage to the lane. But guess what? That ain't as important as it used to be. Keep going. I'm just really excited about that. Uh, corpse feeders, level one. We're still there. This is uh, probably the most underpicked talent if uh, stats are anything to go off of. Uh, it no longer reduces uh, roachling damage against non-heroic tar- er, uh, tar- uh, sources, uh, but it now increases the health of roachlings by 30%. It still reduces the cooldown by three seconds. So you're still getting that three-second cooldown reduction, and now you're just going to increase the health of your roachlings by 30%, which means you're taking less damage from heroes, which is good. Uh, and then infest at level one. This is uh, specifically the active on infest. Uh, initial damage bonus for range minions uh, increased from 100 to 125 percent. This is the starting point of that bonus damage. If you, if you haven't played with this or haven't looked at infest in a while, so you don't remember how it works, it scales in damage based off of the siege damage the guard has done over the course of the entire game. You can get this this bonus damage up by a, a significant amount, but now you are starting at a higher percentage than we did before. Uh, and that's rad. So all of that is good. I'm probably the most excited about Volatile Acid. Probably the Infest change is the one I'm the least excited about. Yeah, I mean, Infest is all right. It's it's a There's a sadness built into you know getting a lane prepped. It's why my Zeratul plans and working on him didn't come to fruition because... I watch Zeratul streams and the Zeratul's like, all right, I'm going to take out this. Thing. Now I've got six stacked archers. Let's get up on that building. And then Ragnaros comes by with one meatball. I'm like, oh, well, that didn't seem like much fun. Some, Better go soak a second lane. There's some. There's a lot of very efficient wave clear right now. It's yes. Just kind of disappointing. But this is perhaps the big Zagara rework. And it's just removing her PVE sort of elements. If you want PVE, you go in fast. There's not a lot of fanfare. You know, there's not a big Sylvanas how to do about it. Well, and and it's not removing them entirely because if you're, yes, you're, you're losing, you're, you're definitely losing PVE damage on Banelings. But if you take Volatile Acid, you're still increasing Baneling damage. It's just now on everything, including heroes. Yes, it's significantly less bonus damage against non-heroic targets, but I will take more teamfight damage any day. Uh, Well, and something like, Increased number of banelings, reduced cooldown, the level seven, they didn't have to touch. We were all doing the slow because banelings now slowed and it gave some amount of utility. 25% slow for 2.5 seconds. Increasing the number of banelings, if that damage is good, that's now a good seven. And it starts to weave into itself. Corpse feeders gets really interesting at 16 because corrosive saliva, this is your giant killer. It used to just be your hunter killers did giant killer damage. And now they're adding that to roaches. So by increasing the health of your roaches and reducing the cooldown, you are getting more giant killer damage at level 16. Kyle, I would just like to stave off an email or two and say we've all been taking Banley Massacre. Wait, we've been... Wait, why? Why why don't we want slow? I thought we were doing slow. We moved out to slow a while ago. To reduce cooldown? We've just been going for more Banelings. Oh, because we were just siege machines, right? Just more Banelings. Okay, well, you know, you don't have to change your pick then. (laughs) That explains a lot, though, because I'm always chasing Baneling targets like, what? what, what? Zagara, get up here. What are you doing back there? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. The the mod change, I think, is pretty boring. Um, I mean, a mana mana cost reduction is always a good thing, but it's always kind of whatever. And the damage increase is so hilariously minor that uh, I don't care. Although, man. Now, hey, now. Damage increase means that your Tyrant's Maw has a higher chance to get a cooldown reduction. I don't... Level 20? Don't don't talk to me about level 20 talents right now, Kyle. 
Okay, let's not let's not even look at level twenty talents for cigar because those were not touched and they need help. And you're probably not seeing them in your games anyway. No, that's true. <laughs> so it all, it all, they they chose they made a tactical choice to not change level twenty talents this patch because they know the meta right now. Except for a lot of the other heroes we just talked about. Yes, yes, yes. I'm a little sad to see Brood Expansion go. I uh, I haven't taken it in probably two years, but do you remember the days of Battle Zagara, Kyle? Do you remember before we had platinum and gold and diamond and we had numbers for our our ranks? Uh huh. That we were going, yep. we were we were doing it, man. We were doing Brood Expansion. We were just like, screw the mutilisk. I just want as many, as much damage as often as I can get. I miss there were days. severely less draft options back then. Yeah. Can we talk about the new talent, though, that's replacing it? Well, 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 hey, well, well, hang on, though. They did something crazy because they took the cooldown reduction talent, which you probably didn't take because you went Nidus Network, which gives you cooldown reduction, but they put it on Mutalisk. Mutalisk now reduces the cooldown by four seconds of Hunter Killer. I totally skimmed that and missed yeah, it. Yeah, that's right. Oh, man. That's actually rough because I want to try the new talent, but uh, if my Mutalisk is just happening four seconds more often, then uh, I don't think I'm moving off of Mutalisk. I mean, I think you should investigate at the very least. What these these upgraded roaches at level level one have over 400 health. I mean, if that thing sticks around, let's see, 16. Let's see how big a roach can get. How many how many auto attacks from a thrall? would it take to kill a giant killing roach? In oh, I'm not excited about space. corrosive saliva. That's this is no one's taking it. I'm calling it right now. Nobody's going to take that. that I'm, I'm excited about the new talent. Jagged barbs. That's the one I'm excited about. That's the you're excited about. Okay. okay oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Let's not judge. No, 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 so, no, you know, thank you for allowing me my excitement. And yes, at level 16 giant killer Zagara is probably not going to be a thing, even though roaches have 800 not- health. <laughs> Not giant killer based off of roach damage. That's but definitely... look at them go. They have an attack speed of one. I mean, they're dealing, you know, an extra, uh, what is it, uh, 120 damage a second? Like, that's that's handsome. But you're, you're probably more correct that a auto attack Zagara, while on creep, she has a t- 20% additional auto attack range. And now they added jagged barbs while on creep. You get... 30% more basic attack damage and increase your range by an additional 10%. That's sustained Zagara. That's pretty handsome. And that's what you're probably actually going to want to be doing. It's very cool. Although I see nothing in here about making your creep tumors a little more resilient. And I think that needs to happen. Uh, yeah, you can get armor on creep, but that doesn't help the creep. You can do Nidus so- Network that increases the size of your creep. Creep spreads 15% further. So yeah, you know, it, yeah. Yeah, the, the creep will still be destroyed. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you could also, at that point, I mean, you're, you could just drop creep right before a fight and do your best to kind of fight around it. But um, whatever the case is, here real is quick, 6.6. Real quick, let's let's develop your, your roach. Your, here, here's what they need to do to make your roach build happen. Hear me out, Kyle. Okay. Okay. Uh, we need a talent somewhere where um, Zagara uh, periodically spawns one roach. What do you think? You like that? Okay. You like that in addition to these other Roach talents? And then um, why don't we just kind of uh, give her some spell armor and increase her health? Well, you got protective creep at 13. If you haven't caught the joke yet, uh, I think what you really want is old Anubarak beetle build. Okay. (laughs) I don't know, this, the 6.6 auto attack thing. I'm coming over to your side. I mean, Bile Drop does give you an extra roach. So that's what I'm going to be running in quick match. I apologize if it's awful to my friends. But I'm going to be trying out Roach Giant Killer Zagara. I think you're going to really like it. I think you're going to break the damage numbers. And I think you're going to very quickly realize that it's like old Gazlo, which used to always break damage meters. But we realized it was random damage and didn't actually yeah. lead to kills. No, it's true. It's true. And I actually don't know what the attack priority of a roach is here. So let's see. Cast one on Arthas, and one of them is attacking Arthas, and one of them farted off on a nearby tower. He walked out of range, and they both went to the tower. Okay, all right. They need some hero priority, and maybe we can make this work. Yeah, yeah. 
So that being said, you if you went that full roach builder, you're going to be like a mercenary god just because of the speed at which your roaches are attacking and you've got an extra roach. Eh, maybe there's something there, Kyle, with the meta shifts. Maybe you... Let me know how it goes. Let me know how it goes. Right, I'm going to try Jagged Barbs. You try that. And then we'll look at the stats in two weeks' time and realize that everyone is still just going mutilisk and we're both wrong. Well, hey, you know, Devouring Maw got that sick damage. I'm going to need it because I'm going to go Bile Drop and I'm going to drop my Infested Drop right on top of my Maw like we did back in 2016. And I'm going to wreck. You'll be sorry. I mean, you should still be doing that. You should still be dropping your bile on your maw. Well, if, if you take maw, is kind of my point. Like, oh. We don't take maw. Um, I've seen some sick maws the past yeah. two weeks. Most cigars in the games I've ended up in have been exclusively going maw, and they're good. They're good okay. with these maws. I don't know. I've been out of the cigar game basically for the entire year of 2019 because uh, I don't think it's worth it. To, to lane like Zagara lanes anymore. But yeah. you Zagara's out there, y'all are, you're giving me some nostalgia for sick Maw plays. And I kind of want to get into it. But we are an hour, almost an hour in, Kyle, and we still got some stuff to talk about. So let's keep the train going right. into uh, Kilthazad town. Because uh, level 7 chilling touch, the bonus damage has been reduced from 100 to 80%. Sure. That's fine. You're not using Chilling Touch for its sick damage. You're using it for the slow so you can line up an easier shot. Exactly. I think the build that... is intact. Yeah. 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 And and, and to, to preface all these changes, the dev said that these changes should be minor. They're intended to better round out Kothasat's talent tiers. Level 10 Frost Blast. The starting missile speed has been increased by 60%. I think they're literally going to have to pay us $5 every time we take it at this point no, well hang on 60 percent. we're getting the pyroblast speeds it, it it still has a whoa above your head mage moment and then it goes and it goes pretty fast yeah but resets or your kelthazad can actually kill somebody by himself and feel like you're winning the game not make everyone do the work for him exactly Kelthazad can kill someone, or he can give everybody a chore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Chase yeah. this, everybody. Yep. Uh, and then icy it's grass. It's a little cruel sounding, but you know <laughs> we're working on it. And then icy grass bat thirteen bonus slow amount increase from fifteen to twenty percent, and the cooldown reduction was increased from point four to an even half a second. Okay. It's true, Chad. It is going a lot faster than pyro, but pyro is going to kill, and this still tickles and roots. Yes. But we're getting there. We're getting there. Yeah. Let's just move on to Genji. Uh, they said that they saw some feedback that Strike at the Heart is a little awkward now and it, uh, that it doesn't match the duration of Genji's reset window on Swift Strike, so we're changing it to now deal all of its damage after one second. Uh, they also are changing a few of his other talents to better compete with their peers. But the big one here is Strike at the Heart, damage dealt reduced from 138 to 134, very minor there. And as they said, the damage is now dealt after one second instead of over two seconds. And you have to be under 1.5 seconds to get a reset, get your sweet kill and get out. So nice. That, that's, that's nice for Genji's. I also just kind of like the RP flavor there. Yeah. That's good. Level 7 augmented shield. The shield amount was increased from 50 to 75% of damage taken. Level 7 dodge, the time before gaining a stack of dodge has been reduced by 1 second, so you're going from 8 down to 7. And then at level 10, X-Strike, the initial damage was increased from 135 to 145, and the final damage was increased to uh, 270 to 290. So there's some nice little damage buffs there on X-Strike. Genji's will be happy. Mm -hmm. And then under minor buffs, just Diablo, level 4, Sacrificial Soul, Souls gained from stunning an enemy hero with Shadow Charged increased from 5 to 10. I like that. If, if you went that talent. Yes. I mean, it's, you're doubling your chart, your uh, souls there, so. It's something. Curious to see if it works out. Kyle, you want to kick us off into nerfs with, uh, with Alarak? I'd love to, but my computer just froze. Oh, no, really? Yeah, so I uh, please read on. Okay. While I restart. 
Well, I can see and hear you just fine, so we will continue. You're on the broadcast computer. Oh, the that's right. Notes. You're one of those two computer setup dudes. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm in my space lab, but my space lab broke. <laughs> All right, Alarak. Uh, base changes to Discord Strike. The damage has been reduced, 175 to 165. Slightly over a 5% reduction there. 5% reduction to Discord Strike's damage. You may live now. You may. You may. Um, I mean, over the course of a game, that's going to add up. Uh, level one, ruthless momentum, got a buff. But yeah, the, the I think the bigger thing here is at level four, show of force, damage reduced. So we got a damage reduction on Discord Strike and a damage reduction on show of force if you're taking it at level four. And according to the devs, what? Alarak has indeed become a dominant force. Uh, skewing even worse at higher levels of play. So they're trying to tone them down. Well, the Ruthless Momentum is a nerf because your threshold for cooldown reduction has been increased. You have to be above 80% health now rather than above 75% health. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. No, no, no. But that we're getting there. And that's really interesting because I hadn't really thought about it. You got to have health in order to have the cooldown reduction. So there is counterplay here. Like Nazebo's spell armor, if you auto-attack him, it goes away. That's a really unique counterplay that even Lili can go take care of. And I like that a lot. I would love to see something like that happen with Ruthless Momentum. Not that I want Alarax to be like always mounted up, like zooming around at 100% health and then getting cooldown reduction because of it. But how much is 80%? Are we in range of a single Frostbolt? Because if we are then you know exactly what you need to do to make sure Alarak's not getting a cooldown reduction. Yeah. Also, we have no way to show health as a percentage, right? That's not an option in the UI anywhere. No, no, you... Well, you could look at the bar and, like, eye it. Well, that's, 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 you know? that's what I'm yeah. getting at, is 75% means you're eyeing for, like, a... Am I above one-fourth of this total bar? 80? That's kind of an awkward thing to eyeball. Yeah. So just a little minor note there. They could put it like a little divot, put a little, a pin in it. A pip for, yeah, a pip. Yeah. I mean, freaking Deathwing is like Pip City. Yeah. With the way his armor works. Yeah. They, they could add that in there. Although, I mean, not that you want to be giving away the goods when you're playing Alarak and like, hey, please hit me below X number. But I mean, it would also help the Alarak to know if he should like, yeah, go take that extra step for that orb or not. Yeah, so. or if he should calm down from his build and, you know, throw out a lightning to heal himself instead of just trying to get sweet three-strike combos to heal himself above this point rather than yelling at poor Lily nearby. I don't like Alarak, so I would say show the pip to the enemies, but don't show it to Alarak. There we go. That's what I He's say. a bold man. Uh, Junkrat. Level four, boom pow, cooldown reduction increase from nine to ten seconds. I mean, that's a good thing. But are we taking boom yeah, pow? They, they do, basically, you're all doing trap builds. Please stop. Yep. Boom pow's okay. Mm -hmm. Level what they're saying. Yep. Level seven, sticky wicket, which uh, is what I call my youngest dog when she gets into sap from an oak tree because her name is Wicket. This is this took too much explaining. It's not funny. Well, uh, it's nice to know your dog's name. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> named after the Ewok because she looks like an Ewok. Uh, level 7 uh, Sticky Wicket. Silence duration was reduced from two and a half seconds to two seconds. Thank God. Thank you. Very happy about this. Uh, I don't play Junk Rat. I just play against them. Uh, and level 10 Rip Tire. The maximum damage was reduced from 775 down to 720. That, that, that stings a little. And yeah. the minimum damage was reduced from 475 to 445. So, yeah, this this stinks if you're a junk rat. Player. I like it. Get, get it out of here. They didn't touch 20 because 20's nuts, and 20 should be nuts. I I love this. Tyra was insane. A little much. A little much. And let's talk about uh, light reworks. Rebalancing retools. I wouldn't necessarily call this a nerf or a buff because we're not too sure yet. I'm starting off with Arthas. This is like arguable. I'm pretty sure this is a buff, but it's just also so weird and different. I'm throwing it under here just for consistency's sake. So, level four, Deathlord talent. This used to increase the range of your death coil. Don't do that anymore. 
However, now, if you use Death Coil on an enemy hero, its mana cost is refunded. You don't get like a percentage back. You don't get a, a set amount back. Refunded, Kyle. You Death Coil a hero, you get all the mana back on that Death Coil. Which means you can be a little bit of a poke monster now if you take this at level four. I guess. I'm upset about this. You could just keep doing it. Like it that yeah. Johanna? Dude, you went on how you spent 10 minutes talking about that Johanna just hanging out. This is a level four talent, something like that matters. Like this, like when the Johanna just hanging out is actually a thing. So you can just be sitting there plinking the Johanna endlessly with a death coil for the entire early stages of the game post level four. If you want to. The man is nice. The whole reason I did a death coil build at all was because I was solo lane Arthas for one. So I'm not main tanking. And we found ourselves with no backline cleanup. So there was always a Leeming or a Genji that was just barely getting away and range on death coil brought it home. That was the whole, I didn't care about any other part of that text except for the range. And now it's gone. And it doesn't really matter, but I'm sad. I mean, they probably could have left it, and it probably would have been fine. Yeah. I don't know why they took the range. Thank you for giving me a proper channel for my anger. I I will meter that with your Arthas. You shouldn't be that far away from people. But the Li Ming and the I know. Genji were I, running away. I know. I know. And I wouldn't turn it down if they kept it in. I think the always refunds into a mortal coil would have been awesome. That would have been interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Minor, minor thing. It, it, it should be fine. I'm marching towards that lame Genji anyway, but it was the only reason I took the talent was for the range. Yeah. It's also, I mean, it, it starts at 164 damage and it's on a nine second cooldown too. So it's also just not the scariest thing in the world. Yeah. So it's probably no one feels happen. death coil really and goes, yeah. ah, Johanna took a death coil to the face. Yeah. <sighs> Anyways, Brightwing. Brightwing. Some interesting things happening here. Uh, all talent changes. So greater polymorph no longer is going to reset the cooldown of polymorph on takedown. Instead, if Brightwing hits an enemy hero with arcane flare center damage while they are polymorphed, then reduce polymorph's cooldown by six seconds and gains uh, 50 mana. It still increases Polymorph's range by 30%. I think they're getting too weird with Brightwing. It's a little weird. I'm happy for an entirely different reason, though. Why? Because Greater Polymorph was one of those talents that every Brightwing main in your Twitch chat would be like, ah, see, you got a kill there. Should have done Greater Polymorph. You would have owned the whole enemy team. And I was like, no, 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 we were already owning. That's why we got the kill. And yes, I would have cast Greater Polymorph a second and a fourth in whatever time. But I'm sorry Hypershift hurt you so much. I'm going to keep casting Hypershift, and I'm really happy that Greater Polymorph is now no longer this what-if-you-could-have-murdered-everybody talent. Dude, Heroes chat rumors are the most results-oriented mother effers on the planet. They have clearly never played a card game, or if they do, they are terrible at them. Oh, that's interesting. I never really made the result. Why would card game players be less results-oriented? Because if you're results-oriented, you will, you're, you, you're going to be bad. You're going to make decisions in deck building and in playmaking based on results and not on averages of overall success over multiple games. Oh, so what, so what you're saying is Brightwing or Heroes of the Storm stream watchers are the kind of people who run decks where you sacrifice seven cultists to get a 7-7. Seven, seven. Yeah, they won a game of Hearthstone with the Ancient One once and think you should build all your decks with it. That ancient one was kind of cool, though. It is very cool. Yeah, yeah it's cool. It's very, I, I very like. Cool. But you're not going like to hit legend. Whole, <laughs> no, no, no. But I like the whole sacrificial altar thing. But yes, it's total butts, and you have to have board advantage. Yeah, yeah. Hero, heroes, uh, live heroes chatters are really bumming me out right now. It's bothering <laughs> me. It's getting, getting... We love you all. We love you all. 
we're not playing the game right now. Our chat room is wonderful because we're sitting here having sane conversations about strategy and not having people shouting at us. So, oh, miss, I mean, it's just it really what I'm describing is Twitch chat in general, which everyone is just miss lethal. It's like, no, no, I actually didn't because math doesn't work that way. But um, just been noticing it more with heroes people lately. And it's annoying. Um, but yeah, I just think this is kind of funky. Uh, I think this is weird. I think there's enough incentive to hit the center of your arcane flare already. I don't think we need to force a combo on Brightwing. And that's exactly what this does. If you take this talent at level one, it forces you to basically cheap flare every single time, which is arguably a good learning tool to actually land your flares, but also makes you, I think, pretty dependent on polymorphing first to even land a flare. So. Well, if you're, I mean, yes. The weird thing is Arcane, Arcane Flare got better the more CC you had and you were aiming at somebody that maybe you wanted to silence later on because you're doing a full Arcane Flare build like White Mane who's standing still in the back line. That's a great silence target. If you don't have all that CC, aiming your Flare at somebody who's polymorphed and slowed by 25% while polymorphed is a pretty good idea. And maybe Greater Polymorph now combos better with Unstable Anomaly, which makes them more slow, which is may maybe cute. Or maybe it combos better with Dream Shot because hitting it at range reduces the cooldown. So maybe it's just about talent. They, they don't want people to just pick all the pretty pictures. This selection is now making more than one talent interesting, a lot like her Zagara. That's fair. It's a fair way to look at it. Um, I mean, also, it, it this is kind of in a roundabout way doing it, 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 doing what you wish they would do with Taranda because if you are actually like landing center shots on Arcane Flare, you are getting more healing out of Bright Wing. So this is still skill based. So you still need to land right. that, but it does lead to more healing. So okay, maybe I'm being too harsh on it. I just. I don't know. I don't love the hyper focus on arcane flare on Brightwing. Like I don't get why uh, why the team seems so focused on that. But doesn't matter. Other things got messed with. Uh, critical mist at level uh, seven. Adjusted functionality. Soothing mist heals allied heroes for one fifty. Double this healing if uh, disabling effect is removed. I like this a lot. Previously it healed for two fifty if an effect was removed, uh, but now you're gonna get base healing of 150 no matter what so you're getting some mileage out of this and if a disabling effect is removed you're getting more healing than you got before so this is just all around better for critical mass yeah. so i like this a lot um, yeah, a, a healing button in an area at level seven which is is all right you know we got peekaboo we got sticky flare now we actually have like a healing button that's not shielding so cool. Well, a healing cleanse in a way. Um, yeah, I like yeah, it that too. I like it a lot. Uh, and then level 13 safety dust. Uh, bonus allied healing has been increased from 25 to 75%. That's a massive buff. Uh, and now has a crit kicker to show when the bonus healing is applied. Now, um, 13 is interesting. It actually has pretty decent talent diversity. So I think this is good. There's a decent amount of bright wing players already taking safety dust. So this is just a buff. That's a, it's a crazy buff. Yeah, it's huge. Because you don't you do not do this so you do your passive healing. You do it so you then teleport to them with blink heal and heal them totally up. Yeah, it's really That's cool. That's a lot of healing. It's really cool. Now, this wasn't. This is probably the talent I took the least at 13, but uh, going off statistics, quite a few Brightwing players were. So that's uh, so what's kind of cool about this. Hmm. My off pick for this one was the um, was the Pixie Boost. I like the forty percent move speed on Pixie Boost. Yeah, that was cute. I mean, sometimes in spell armor, like those Kelphazad games, that's what you took Bright Wing for the first place for. So I, I can see why Safety Dust fell behind, but that just seems crazy to me when I favor Blink Heal when I play Bright Wing. Yeah, well, you're probably gonna like it. Rhaegar, one change, level four. 
Feral Heart. It no longer increases Rhaegar's mana regeneration while in ghost form. Instead, Ghost Wolf attacks are going to give Rhaegar 1% of his maximum mana uh, back, and this will be times four against enemy heroes. So it's going to be quadrupled against enemy heroes. Uh, according to the devs, they, thought, they just thought it was straight up awkward that Feral Heart motivated Rhaegar players to stay in Ghost Wolf form. I agree with this. Yeah. Um, they they want to change it so that you are playing aggressively as you should as a Rhaegar. I like this a lot. I haven't sat down to do the math to find out like how that like how much mana am I getting from you know dog biting one hero versus how long did it take me to get that mana back in ghostful form? I don't know. Not too sure, <laughs> but uh, in principle, I really like this change. Right. The mana you get back from shield is highly controllable. It works in lane clear situations. Biting as a Rhaegar is always dangerous because you could end up somewhere really strange sometimes. Being attached to an enemy hero who might leap or do something weird, increase their speed. Thematically, though, Rhaegar looping in the background, you know, like your dog in the morning, just running track in your backyard when he should be up doing things was silly. And this is a fantastic adjustment to his gameplay style. Yeah, I don't know the cooldown of Ghost Wolf off the top of my head. What is it? Oh, it doesn't even say. I believe say. it's four seconds. Is it four seconds? Okay. That's probably too much, though. I was going to say, why don't, maybe they, like, there's maybe an argument for making the base mana regeneration like 2% and then say double against heroes. Because I do feel like when you go off to Merc, as you will as a Rhaegar, uh, maybe this feels a little bad if, if you were like a Merc happy Rhaegar and you were taking Feral Heart to begin with. But yeah, that's going to take some math, right? Cause you're not really doing night camps by yourself early on. You're working on those giants. So are you getting more back Feral Harding coming out of that bush? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm biting around right now. You're... Give me a whopping five. It's probably better. I would think because you're biting in the middle of taking a Merc camp. Whereas before you would only be regenerating mana like on the run to the Merc camp. So it's probably well, it's 1% better. Of, it's 1% of max mana on these Merc camps. So you get a whopping five mana for doing a bite. Mm. That's kind of, that's not the best. No, it isn't. But let's see what, it, let's see what I get with a, uh, with a little storm collar action. Okay. Love it. Two fours a second, eight. So eight every time that thing spins around. So that's just better. Yeah. 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 Okay. Interesting. Feral Heart, I mean, wasn't like the go-to to begin with, but. No, but it's still, it's still interesting. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. Thematically, yeah. We're, we're getting there. Yeah. Yeah. And then Lunara, uh, Nature's Toxin Trade. The damage scaling per level was reduced from 5 to 4%, but the damage was increased from 30 to 36. Okay. We're evening things out. They're long ago in the before time, they made choices that heroes should have different scaling in order to change who would be powerful during what parts of the game. Yep. Now they're just going back to baseline. Yeah. Lon Lonara was one of those heroes. Sweet. Oh. Yep. And and that's it. We did it, Kyle. We made it through the balance changes. All right. Yep. Uh, in other news this week, we, from uh, blue posts on uh, Reddit and places like that, we've learned that uh, Deathwing has changed a decent amount since BlizzCon. Uh, a large balance pass was made. He has quite a few different talents than what we saw at BlizzCon. And uh, almost every single one of the effects on Deathwing, like the fire effects and ground effects and whatnot, have, uh, have been touched up. Um, they made changing forms more distinguished. So There's going to be a lot more obvious uh, when he, when Deathwing changes forms, what form he's changing into. Uh, they also added team color elements for uh, Dragonflight and his Cataclysm ability. And then uh, Blizz Thomas went kind of deep into the uh, kind of philosophy of effects design and said that Deathwing was specifically challenging because of the scale and nature of his effects because he is so fire-oriented. Um, saying, quote, making things work well and look distinct between teams and next to other heroes with similar elements was a big challenge. Per particularly called out Kelthos in this exact example, uh, saying it was a really 
cha- big challenge there. Uh, continued saying, we decided to not have a direct, uh, a direct visual indicator. Uh, this is talking about uh, what stance uh, that Deathwing is in at the moment. Uh, for numerous reasons, the main one being that persistent effects on a character are not only very expensive, but they generally add more clutter than they're worth. Uh, Malthiel is a good example of, of another hero that went through this struggle. His, uh, his mark had some nine iterations, nine iterations, Kyle, before they landed on the assortment of effects and icons uh, that he has now. And uh, according to Blizz Thomas, he still doesn't think that it's as clear or uh, as it could or should be. And continued saying Deathwing, though, is very different. And the reality is that you're going to know what form he's in very quickly based on the abilities he uses. But he's casting those abilities at you, so you're not going to get any ahead notion. He's already weird, so I'm not all that concerned. Like, if they went through and gave Johanna two forms, DPS and CC, I'd really like to know which one's walking at me. But Deathwing lands, cataclysms are to follow. Right, right, exactly. So I just thought that was interesting because it had to have been. I, 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 it had to have been hard uh, to... It's Deathwing. He's huge. There's fire everywhere. How am I going to see what the hell is happening underneath my feet? <laughs> like, I mean, I, I granted if uh, Deathwing fire is happening under my feet and I should be concerned about what's happening under my feet, it's probably not the biggest issue unless Deathwing is on my team and it's good fire. I don't know. There is a word usage in here that they corrected themselves on saying very expensive. It is CPU expensive. It is expensive in the files to make that effect happen. They do not mean we can't afford to make Deathwing more shiny. Oh, yeah. I should probably point that out. Uh, They talked a lot about that on the panel at BlizzCon, which you haven't watched. I highly recommend it. Um, Because they uh, they talked about, like, especially with his um, ground effects, because there's a lot of rock and rubble involved. Uh, that they got pretty creative with like a single rock of making it different sizes and different orientations so that as far as the system is concerned, it's the same asset. But you get this layering effect that looks like a ton of different rocks. Um, I, I find that kind of stuff fascinating, like the budgeting of what your compu- of what the, uh, the, the game can handle. Yeah, I mean, we know they pulled some tricks with like Asmodan, who's a big character, and in order to make sure those are high res, he's mirrored. Not unlike your creepy Bethesda characters. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. My uh, my voice is going out. I still have a bit of a cough after all this flu jazz. Um, and then uh, more skins are coming at some point. This also came out of some blue comments uh, this past week. And uh, Keena Brew kind of gave us a, a look into the development cycle of skins and, and said that basically the challenge with any of this kind of stuff, uh, the way that Keena Brew put it, is, quote, production of a game... Uh, the game's art is like a train. It's a giant mass of metal moving down a track because it is so big and moves at a certain speed. Lots of content has to be planned out a year in advance to get where it is going. Sometimes we have the flexibility to pivot and make those cool skins in a shorter time frame, but that is under perfect conditions with everything lining up just right. Uh, so it went on to talk about like they're just rounding the corner on another skin, and by rounding the corner, they mean it still has to go through like five different departments. <laughs> before it's finished um oh wait maybe not five i think you mentioned two it still needs to go through animation and fx so uh there's a lot more work that goes into skins than than we think especially the big skins the ones we get excited about well and i never realized that high poly and low poly skins are designed they you don't are you don't just like turn down the fidelity you don't just fuzz it out and say good to go someone actually paints or makes a low poly skin (laughs) to look as best as it can in low poly and when you upgrade it it looks nice as well yeah yeah makes sense that one can that be my job because i'm I'm like an okay artist i'm not the best can i just get hired as a like mid-range quality texture artist (laughs) There you go. <laughs> I'm sure that's not how it works. I'm sure it's probably no, no. Same artist, a lot of talent, same stuff. Uh, Kyle, before we uh, wrap this up with an email or two, we have a sponsor to thank today. We do. You like? Uh, are you are you particularly passionate about socks, Kyle? I wasn't. I, I wasn't either until uh, Bombas sponsored into the Nexus. Um, listen, holidays are coming up, man. Like, and if you're giving everybody Bombas socks. 
you deserve a spot in the Holiday Gift Giving Hall of Fame. They are so soft. They are so comfortable. They're stylish, dude. Stylish style. You know me. You know me. I've got a thing for dress socks. It's been a while since I had gotten some. So when Bombas hit us up, I was like, okay, yeah, I need some I need some dress socks. And they sent me some dress socks. I've got some floral pattern dress socks now. And it's like the softest cotton in the world. And if you need warmer socks, they've also got merino wool socks, which are soft, warm, and naturally moisture wicking. Not a thing I need to worry about living in Florida, but maybe you do, Kyle. You live in a pretty cold climate. I do. I got some workout socks, some hiking socks. And listen, if you're still going to the department store and, you know, buying like 1930s, like Steamboat Willie tube socks, technology's advanced. Things have changed. (laughs) And your feet can be way more comfortable. They can be. They can be. Yeah. They even also, also offer arch support in the sock. It like feels like a nice little hug for your foot. It's wonderful. And on top of all of this, Mamas donates a pair of socks to someone in need for every pair you buy. Turns out socks are the most requested item in homeless shelters. So you feel good about the socks you're buying on top of feeling good just because they're comfortable. So uh, go check them out. If you've never given them a look, go to bombas.com. That's B-O-M-B-A-S.com slash Nexus. You're going to get yourself 20% off any purchase during their big holiday sale. This runs from November 18th all the way through December 5th. So go now, bombas.com slash Nexus. Again, I'll spell it out for you. It's B-O-M-B-A-S.com slash Nexus. You're going to get 20% off, and you're going to support Into the Nexus in the process. So go check them out. Plenty of styles to choose from. Let them know Into the Nexus sent you. With that done, we are going to bring this thick episode, spelt with two Cs, home with some questions from our community. Darkness stopped. Calling. Does anyone else hear that buzzing? Hold on. Darkness just texted me. You can send your emails to itncast at gmail.com or if you're a patron, link your Discord to your Patreon account because congratulations, you automatically get access to the patron-only Discord. Every level, every patron. Check it out. Tau of Craft writes in, says, I don't really understand the concern about last hitting. Can you help me understand your concern? My expectation is that you or your teammates kill their minions. The orbs would only be collectible by your team and not the enemy. I can understand that you may be outside the collectible range and that might cause some heroes to have to adjust their play. When I think of last hitting, I think of League, where the experience is individualized and you kill something, your ally can steal your experience from you because it is not shared. You mean that the enemy may be able to steal your experience. Um, no, I mean, like, I have to, like, if a minion wave or, like, a friendly minion killed the thing instead of me killing it and I was nearby, I don't get the experience. That's my concern. Right. And that's the orb drop that you nearby should still collect. And what we sort of talked about split over two episodes was, does Jaina dropping a blizzard, mounting up, and riding away allow her to create XP that flows to her by being the person who killed the minion? Or does it sit in lane and you have to have somebody nearby collect it? And that's what we're talking about last hitting. I had not even thought about for years. When I think of last hitting, I think of Dota and people going, whoa, 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 slam. Because they just, they it's stupid looking. They just stand around canceling their own auto attack until the exact moment where they're then going to slam down and complete the auto attack. I have not even thought about the awful truth that was somebody coming by with a battle fury and cleaving my entire lane when I thought that money was for me. So I race them to last hit it so I can become rich instead. We're, we're not even talking about that. That's, that's crazy. And a reason why we play heroes of the storm. Yeah. Yeah, I also talked just about the concept uh, of me not liking last hitting and other MOBAs, so you may have maybe misconstrued that as me talking about heroes as well. So, uh, yeah, we, there's been a lot of talk about this, and, and the fact is, at this point, we're, we're probably going to kind of distance ourselves from talking about the XP orb anomaly until we know more. We need to know more. It feels like the team is still figuring out certain, you know, minutiae of how it's going to work. Um so I, 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 I think we should probably put the talk of uh, the, the XP orb anomaly on pause until we know more. Um, but yeah, it's just a lot of concerns about 
what heroes kind of get a special pass like Ragnaros's lava wave versus heroes that don't uh, with with ranged abilities and whatnot. So, um, yeah. Harry writes in, it says, question, I play in a group of three to five, a lot of the time, most of whom are completely self-sufficient. That being said, a couple of people I play with often need to be told every single action they need to do by the shot caller, e.g. soak, come in as the objective is about to pop, follow the rest of the team to boss, etc. They have the game knowledge and have been playing for years, but when playing in a group, seem to need to be micromanaged. At its worst, this has resulted in them asking what talents to pick on their mains when the rest of us do not play those heroes and do not know. Ooh, that's bad. Uh, this often leads to the shot caller having to do twice as much work and thinking uh, and at the back of their head having to worry about these players not following the flow of the game. This can detract from their ability to concentrate on the bigger picture and has cost us a couple of games. So my question is, how can I constructively, as one of the two shot callers in our group, encourage them to be more self-sufficient and follow the flow of the game. As a bit of additional background, we are all gold one to diamond five in terms of rank and have all been playing for at least three years pretty consistently. For my own morbid curiosity, I really wish you had included uh, the ranks of the problem players because I'm curious if they're higher or lower ranked or if it's a mix mismatch. Yeah, there there is a... Fun balance when you get together. Like sometimes you don't really care about the question who would win in a fight, Mega Man or Sonic. But because you're hanging out with your nerd friends, you just throw out some questions just to hang out, you know? Yeah, there's nothing else really to talk about. So you just, you just pluck something out of the air. And it almost sounds like that's what your friends are doing. They're like, oh man, what talent should I do? And you're like, I don't know, man. I don't play Mouthiel. Pick your ta- You're the Mouthiel player. Pick your talent. It could just be that they're just hanging out. That they're just wanting conversation. But you're like, the game is starting. I I, I want to win. What are we doing fighting about level one talents? Just, just go. But there's no reason to discuss this. Yeah. Um, boy. So... Kyle, you we're we're kind of the 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 good cop bad cop. I wouldn't play with these people anymore. No, <laughs> I would ghost them. Uh, that's how oh, I would handle man. this situation. Um, sorry, anyone, if you've ever played a game with me and I haven't got a better way to play with you again, I'd probably you know, or I also got distracted and forgot that we played together. Um, yeah, I. Uh, it, it's been so long since I've had a regular group for a game. Um, but this was not tolerated when I raided. When I had a hardcore mm-hmm. raid group, this just was not tolerated. We would kick you from the group. Um, if, if like, I know I'm applying like wow to heroes here, but it's the best I've got because I haven't had a locked in group for a game basically since I was a hardcore raider. And it was just a lot of this comes down to the uh, expectations that you set from the get go when you create the group um, because that would telling them, you know, hit the highway uh, in our raid was expected. When you joined the group, you kind of knew that that was the way business was conducted, that you were expected to show up every week with your potion, uh, sorry, your, with your flasks, uh, and it, at least a vague understanding of each boss fight, uh, and obviously how your your class played. Um, and 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 at the very least, I think a little bit of tough love goes a long way. Is just like like if they seriously don't know how to play their hero, um, just ask them. Ask them to do some research. Like, hey, could you carve an hour out of your week to just study up? Go look at some stats. Go see how people are building your hero. Maybe go find the streamer that plays your hero. Watch one of their games, just one. See how they build them. See how they play them. You know, you can ask them to do that. Ask them to do a little bit of homework. Um, cause it sounds like you play pretty regularly and I don't think that is a big ask. Uh, I don't think a little bit of homework is a big ask for a gaming group that plays on the regular, because think about it. Have you ever played a, a tabletop game? You have some homework you need to do between sessions. Have you ever played in a raid in any MMO? Could you imagine in a regular raid, Kyle, someone shows up and doesn't know how to play their role. 
Like it's raid night. Someone shows up and goes, hey, how do I spec my paladin? You just go, that, that, that would be completely unheard of. I think no matter what range of, uh, of casualness your raid group is, like that's just obscene. So why, why do we have more leniency for it in a game like this? I realize that it's a well, game where you can change heroes every single time. Right. Um, but, but to a certain degree, uh, that, that, that's also, I guess, on you as the friend to know when it's crossing a line. Is it a hero they're playing all the time and they're asking those questions? Okay, it's time to have a talk. Did everything they play get banned and they're moving on to something for the first time that they've never played before? All right, leniency is probably called for in that, in that regard. If that keeps happening, it's time to have a roster talk, have a little powwow, figure out what they should add to their roster so that this doesn't happen as often. There's a lot of, I don't know, I'd like to make a flow chart out of this, Kyle. Sure. Well, and, and th but that's fun for us. Like we obviously we run this show and we often have our meta check-ins, which get really crunchy. Like you and I, when it comes to map picks and rosters, get pretty damn excited. It's specking the hero. It's doing your dailies. It's getting everything nice and pretty. So when it's raid time, it's go time. And people who show up, they're not putting in the homework. And I don't understand why you didn't enjoy that mini game. People are always like, I want ways to play WoW by myself. And I'm like, there is a way. You go to the target dummy and you learn to play. So when we all play together, like that's where I'm with you. I agree though that in this game where there is way more characters to pick from, there is going to be elements where they may not know everything. They may think there is an opportunity for something cool. And like Rainer is an interesting case. You know, let's do, we got Executioner, which is pretty cool. You know, you're going to do more damage to the Battlefield of Eternity boss. That could be interesting. Or you're going to stack on our slows. Well, we're going to draft an Arthas, so you need to take that slow talent because we're going to get cute in that avenue. Phoenix as well. If that's the conversation we're having, like, man, is there a different, like, should I do Executioner or should I do slow when we have an Arthas? Like, now that's like an interesting conversation you can have. But what I'm also concerned about is not so much that they're doing their homework, like, maybe they're using you as an opportunity to go relaxed which is frustrating when it's a bright wing. I know I've kind of been dissing on bright wings today. I'm just having fun. Pardon me. But th there is a caliber of bright wing that happens all the time where they go, hey, holler if you need me. And I know you're being chummy. But what I really want to hear is I'll teleport in when you need me because I'm too busy doing my stuff to know when you think your teleport cooldown is on cooldown, you want to go to the bot lane sky temple. Like soak it up, join us when you believe you can teleport in and save a life. And that's a skill that you must develop. It's As a, a solo laner, I would like to say I think solo laners should call out when a gank happens. With a bright wing. Wait, hang on. When a gank... Oh, like, you, you want to be summoned down as the bright wing. If I'm playing, like, Rexar or Sony and I'm solo laning and there's a bright wing on the team, I think it's on me to shout when extra people start showing up to the solo lane. I disagree completely. I think they should be mini map machines and be on top of that. That is your job. You shouldn't be playing by bright wing if you can't do that job. But as a solo lane player, I understand your point of view because you get to go hard and get to tunnel vision. And that's how you win a solo lane. And when the whole team is helping out on voice comms being like, Rexar, go get a wall. Like nobody, we, count count four you count four awesome like i need i need that amount of focus to win a 1v1 up here because it's that crunchy of a battle so i agree and disagree in two different avenues right wing i disagree but i agree with you on the solo front well then i'm just gonna take a dump on here on the entire heroes community none of you ever learned to call missing so as a solo laner i uh i i, yeah. I have i've met i have gank ptsd and i am happy to yell, I'm getting ganked, if there's a bright wing on my team. It's true, and our maps are smaller, our movement speed with mounts is fast and strange and hard to predict, like, it, mortal sin against you, straight to the ninth layer in Dota if you didn't call missing, because you're basically saying, hey, in five minutes, someone's gonna come up there and bother you, and you're like, well, oh, that was really good to know. I might not be thinking in five minutes about something that happened on the mini-map. <laughs> in five minutes, you're gonna forget that missing was called, and you're gonna it, die it, anyway. Well, it's still your fault, but that's a yeah. whole different story. Yeah. So, so sounds like 
you have one other option for you, but you already said you're one of two shot callers. So that's interesting, but you can div- divvy up work more. And like your Merc camper says when they want to Merc camp, not ask permission. You go Merc camp when you want. I, as the solo laner, will cover your lane. So you need to say cover my lane. You need to give me proactive information that I can work with rather than asking permission. There's just a, I don't know. I think there's a lot to kind of pick apart here. But totally. I imagine if Harry is writing in about this, that it's, I have to imagine it's not scenarios where Harry is aware that uh, the teammates are getting forced on the heroes they don't typically play. I would yeah. have to imagine it's pretty consistent. But, um, yeah, I mean, it can be tough for sure, but. Yeah, it sounds like you should just kind of talk. Do you have any out-of-game strategy discussion? Because mm-hmm. uh, if you don't, you should, that I think would be the most like top-down overarching tip I would give you is talk before you start playing games that night. Do you do a warm-up game? Do you all head in a quick yeah. match for game number one before you get, start drafting? That helps a lot for me. I know. Warm-ups matter a lot. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Especially as the Rexar player, I got I got to get that I got to get that bear finger, you know, I got to get that D key warmed up. So. Well, and, and to the chat, I'm not saying that's unknown. I'm saying I encourage you to divide up your shot calling in as many jobs as possible. It means everyone starts to become an expert in their avenue. Uh, not so much that it's a foreign idea to me that there is multiple shot callers, but in a more casual environment we can like really get weird with those jobs and really find something that everybody's good at. And that just feels good. Like that is, that is just like a, a office meeting culture, HR sort of thing to do. Like just find what everyone's good at and make sure they're enjoying themselves and feeling rewarded. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> well, cool. Well, hopefully that helped Harry. I know we got a little, a lot of little in the weeds there, but I, uh, I hope that was helpful. Let us know. Shoot no, us a tweet. It, it, ITN cast yeah. check in. It's such an intense situation too, because yeah, I, I can I can feel I can feel you wanting to play with these people, but they just don't take it as seriously as you, and that is that is a rough spot to be in. And if if our advice didn't hold true, like at least know that you have our hearts, because damn, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, keep them coming. ITNcast at gmail.com. If you're a patron, you can just hit us up directly in the patron discord. Lots of great people in there. And again, patron discord. I just want to give you a big fat shout out today. Y'all helped us make the show happen today because we were way off schedule. The, the update got pushed way later than we would have ever expected it. And the second the notes were up, you, I found out about the notes being up because of our Discord. So thank you so much. You literally helped the show happen today as fast as it possibly could. You guys kick ass. If you like Into the Nexus, you want to support us, you want to join that group of badass folk in the patron Discord, head on over to patreon.com slash ITN. And while we're thanking our patrons, we definitely want to thank our producers, Declan H, Cheesy Bob, Chris K, and Robert M. One more producer slot if anyone wants it. Go check it out. Patreon.com slash ITN. You can catch us live typically Thursdays at five or at 3 p.m. Eastern time on twitch.tv slash TV. But next week is the is Thanksgiving here in the U.S. So if you uh, are wanting to see Into the Nexus, we're doing it late Tuesday night, Kyle. And we have a guest. I was pitching to you because the dogs are being loud. Oh, oh, so, sorry. Our guest is Zane Hyde, writer of guides, tank. Teacher extraordinaire. You know him from streams. You know him from Reddit. Saint High will be joining us next week talking all about, well, Deathwing, XP orbs, and that sort of, is there going to be double tank? Like, is that where we're going? XP soak through the tanks? Like, well, we're going to talk to him about that. And, of course, all your questions. Getting another view on things. He's got some views different than not Paradox. So, you know, it's going to get a little scandalous up in here. You know how much I enjoy that. Can't wait to have him on. Look forward to that next week. Nice. Also, you should listen to the Angry Chicken on Tuesday, even if you don't play Hearthstone, because we're having Trixler on. Oh, neat. Yeah, he's casting the Battlegrounds. He did. He casted the Battlegrounds. And I was like, hey, Trick, 
we, I haven't had you on a podcast since we talked to Apex. You should come on. Yeah. He's like, I'm there, buddy. So I talk to uh, Trixler and Angry Chicken. Just gonna just Tuesday is just gonna be I'm just jam packed with podcasts. Uh you may, may, may see me just get the thousand yard stare at some point during the uh, live show. So it'll be funny. You should tune in, watch it live and go, Oh, oh, Garrett's getting sleepy. There it is. There it is. Garrett's thinking about pumpkin pie. That's what's happening. But before we go, Kyle, where can, uh, where can folks keep up with you when you're not doing into the nexus? You can find everything I do over at kyleferguson.com to S as in Ferguson. You should check out if you're listening to this as of Monday or Tuesday, the season three of Kyle explains or DM gives inspiration. If you are a blossoming or curious about starting a Dungeons and Dragons game with you as dungeon master, be sure to check out DM gives inspiration wherever podcasts can be found. Big NPC episode coming up about making characters, telling stories. Everyone should go check that out. You can find me on Twitter at Garrett art. All of the podcasts that I do, this one included is over at a move.tv. If you've never been, it's a M O V E dot TV. The angry chicken can be found over there. If you're into Hearthstone, we're talking a lot about battlegrounds that new mode. So if you are learning how to play, if you're trying to get on top of the latest balance changes, Last episode of The Anger Chicken talked about all of that, as well as uh, the new cards that are coming in the Scent of Dragons, if you're more of a constructed player. Uh, you can also find Let's Talk About Star Wars. A uh, new episode is up, covering the first two episodes of The Mandalorian, and we'll have a new episode out next week for episode three, doing our best, fighting our busy schedules to get an episode up every single week while The Mandalorian is uh is coming out on Disney Plus. I'm so happy with it. You can hear me rant about how happy I am about it over on Let's Talk About Star Wars. You can also find me streaming World of Warcraft, usually on Monday, Wednesday, Friday mornings, but Thanksgiving is next week, and I was kind of sick again this morning, so I didn't stream this morning. But I will be back Monday uh, for Classic and Coffee. Getting so damn close to 60, I can taste it, Kyle. Everybody go check it out over at twitch.tv slash TV. That's going to wrap it up for this episode of Into the Nexus. Until Tuesday, which will be the next episode of Into the Nexus, good luck and have fun, everyone. Take care.